This, this evening is a much more complicated affair than meets the eye. Uh, I was talking to Neil Levin earlier, and he was, was telling me how much research went in to putting together this evening's performance, how manuscripts were gathered from Israel, from Yale, from many other institutions around the world, even though the bulk of the manuscripts that make up tonight's performance come from the Evo archives. And what made this possible was three things. One, a grant from the Anne E. Leibowitz Foundation that has made it possible for Neil Levin, Professor Neil Levin, to be the Anne E. Leibowitz Scholar in Residence at the Ebo Institute. The endowment for tonight's uh, Crum concert from from the Sydney, uh, the estate of Sydney Crum, and for a grant from the uh, New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, uh, which made it possible for us to commission an original piece of music for tonight's performance. The amount of research that has gone into creating this performance has taken well, well over six months, perhaps as much as nine months. Solid, piecing, things together, piecing this history together. What you will hear tonight, people around the world have never heard in one place before. In many cases, these pieces of music have not been heard for decades. And the biographies of the composers and the history of the organization, which forms the basis of tonight's performance, has, is the subject of, of Professor Levin's essay in the program, which I hope you will all take home with you and read. You will not read this anywhere else. And so, allow me to say a few words about Neil Levin, who is, as many of you know, a leading musicologist and his, uh, historical scholar. He's a uh, a professor at Jewish Theological Seminary. Um, he's written two books, 300 articles and essays, and is considered by uh, e everyone, including his uh, fervent enemies, uh, a leading scholar of Jewish music in the world. Neil. Thank you very much, Jonathan. It's not true, but it doesn't matter. Nothing is true anymore, as we know. <laughs> so tonight's concert is titled Joachim Stuchewski and the Music of His World. But as a composer, a cellist, and an advocate of Jewishly related music, Stuchewski belongs to at least two manifestly Jewish worlds. First to the circles of the New Jewish National School in Music, uh, founded in Russia, as most of you know, in the first decade of the 20th century, although Stuchevsky pursued that route in Vienna for a decade until the Anschluss. And then after 1938, he belongs to the world of the music of modern Israel, initially in Palestine, when there was such a place on the map called Palestine. And then continuing seamlessly in the new Jewish nation, new only because of its international recognition as a sovereign state. And these are his two overlapping Jewish worlds that are represented on this evening's program, all of whose music is informed by some aspect of distinctly Jewish experience. Stuchevsky's creative life was one of evolving perceptions 
and conundrums about what can or should be construed legitimately as what he and his colleagues called Jewish music, which is what I shall explore. Stuchewski agonized throughout his years about just what the notion and the tag Jewish music means, should mean, if anything. And that was long before the confusion that's now spread by the current rash of unsupportable spurious claims in the name of so-called Jewish musicology, which in turn have spawned kind of misguided virtual, I would say, industries of their own. You know, my students frequently say to me, very cordially, by the way, Professor Levin, you should have been born in the 19th century or at least a few generations ago. And of course, you know, I usually tell them that they, they have a point. I mean, except I, I kind of like modern medical advances and <laughs> up-to-date indoor plumbing is good too. But, but you can take that with a grain of kosher salt. And the fact is that had I been born early enough uh, to have been able to discuss all of this with Stuchewski, I really like to think I could have saved him from a lot of his agonizing. Perhaps, perhaps beginning with just a slight alteration of that tag to include just a couple more words. So, music of Jewish experience or Jewishly related music makes all the difference in the world. It's kind of like the English music comedian Anna Russell, anyone remember Anna Russell? Her characterization of the words of Wagner's ring cycle are similar to mine about the tag Jewish music. They mean absolutely nothing on its own. Now I wanna say at the outset that um, nothing I reveal or, or share with you this evening should be misinterpreted as disparaging the work of so many, I would say most, uh, colleagues in my, I suppose you would say, intersecting fields of Judaica, music history, and uh, Jewish cultural exploration. Actually, to the contrary, my concern is what I call a fashion of infectious fantasies that increasingly deceive the general public and even the highly educated public, which deserves better. And. To make it worse, the infection seems to have seeped into some of the halls of the academy where it can easily capture the unsuspecting imagination of young and future contributors to these fields in what would otherwise be very serious and important ways. So if a few cherished bubbles get burst in the name of verity, it's only because there are some bubbles that are badly in need of lancing. Now, I've been quoted many times as saying that there is no such thing as Jewish music, including here at YIVO by my good friend Alex Weiser, I don't know where you are, but fully with my permission. It's, that's not exactly what I mean. It's not so much that there's no such thing, but that the many diverse types, forms, faces, of specifically Jewish experience that are open to musical expression would require many Jewish musics in the plural. And by the way, it's not just a matter of things Jewish. That, that um, hollowness of that umbrella rubric for any music uh, is equally true. If, for example, I refer to French music as in, for example, I like French music or uh, Professor Shimshin Hagibor is an expert in French music. What do I mean? Just what do I mean? There's none of you who could know what I mean. Do I mean Machot or Josquin? Do I mean Debussy? Do I mean Edith Piaf? Do I mean the latest Eurovision entry in the pop song contest? Do I mean Olivier Messiaen? Or do I mean Meyerbeer and Offenbach? And just because Meyerbeer and Offenbach came from important German Jewish, German Jewish and religiously committed parentage, would anyone seriously think of Lafrequin 
or La Vie Parisienne as Jewish music and not quintessentially French opera and French operetta? I'm afraid, uh, actually, the answer is yes, pretty soon, because I can expect some doctoral dissertation very soon, any day now, um, you know, claiming to prove the imagined Jewishness of French opera like that. So we have now the issue that Stuchevsky wrestled with, the issue of essence, of something being something, something being, in fact, something. There is part of what is Jewish music, as opposed to what suggests, what reflects, what echoes, and so forth. Now, if we want an airtight definition of being Jewish, every one of you knows that. It's very simple. It's a person with a Jewish mother, halachically, and if you want to accept a reform view with a mother or a father, okay, parent, or someone who has undergone a bona fide conversion. That's it, it's very simple. I don't know of any note on the piano. You tell me. Which one? Which one has a Jewish parent? And which one saw the inside of a mikveh ever? The point is, I, music can't be Jewish. The operative force at play regarding music, I think from composer standpoints, but I think even more so from audience perspectives, is association. Association. So, if I play the following, what comes to mind to everybody? What comes to mind? A tikva? Really? The Moldau? Okay, we'll come back to that. A tikva. Let me play you something else. why that, which is much older, isn't really the source for HaTikva? Is there anyone who, I know there's at least one person here who knows that. I mean, right away, you're going to think of HaTikva if there's an emotional association. But it's an Anglican church communion hymn. You can hear it in any Episcopal church that has good Anglican church music. It's a communion hymn. It's called Let All Mortal Flesh Keep Silence. The thing is, it's a 17th century hymn to a 5th century liturgy of St. James. But it's the association. Back to the Moldau. What's the Moldau? For heaven's sakes, it's the first six notes of a minor scale. If I had... $100 for every instance of the first six notes up and down of a minor scale in the entire repertoire of Western music, liturgical, folk, classical, popular, I would have enough money to endow YIVO in perpetuity. And I would, by the way. I mean, so what? First place, the Moldau's in 6 8. Where's this? I mean, that's what makes the phrase. And then the middle section, the B section. It's not there, so what? And yet, whoever said Moldau is not wrong because that's been thought for many, many years. In fact, Musically knowledgeable German Jews, which means virtually all German Jewry, when asked in Palestine in the 1930s and 40s, um, all said, oh yes, the uh, Hatikva comes, comes from the Moldau. 
And then after 1948, um, I even remember in the 50s and 60s at symphony concerts where people of a certain generation would hear the Moldau and they came running up. And these were people who had no previous Zionist uh, affiliations uh, so, and so forth. And they still came up. Did you hear? Did you hear Hatikva in the orchestra? Why? It's very simple. Emotional association. I mean, I had a, I think it was a middle school classmate, went to Juilliard for a prep school audition, a prep division audition. And came back, he said he was in the halls and he heard, you know, 25 students from 25 practice rooms practicing minor scales because some jury was coming up. And he, for a nanosecond, he said to himself, everybody here must be Jewish at Juilliard because they're all playing Hatikva. <laughs> this has nothing to do with facts. It's emotional association because the fact is, I heard somebody say it, uh, Hatikva tune was adopted wholesale from a Moldavian Romanian folk tune about a humorous one about a farmer bringing his oxen to market and it was adopted for that for Imber's poem in 1888. It has nothing to do with any with, with Moldau or anything else. Anyone who went last Pesach to the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue here would have heard the prayer tal, the prayer for do, the same da da di da da da. It's just five notes of a minor scale. It's very much like I remember high school years, I'd be walking down the street or sitting in a car with my father, and uh, I would point to a certain woman on the street corner waiting for, to cross, and I'd say, Dad, who does that woman remind you of? Who does she look like? He, invariably, he would say to me, Neil, I know exactly who you mean, and she doesn't remind me of her at all, and she doesn't look anything like her. <laughs> That's the problem with, it's absolutely true. That's the whole problem with these resemblances in music and so forth. Um, to give you some idea of what people have perceived or tried to pass off as quote unquote Jewish music, I could share with you dozens, I could share with you hundreds of essays that used to accompany submissions of scores to the Milken Archive for me to look at for, uh, with the hope of being recorded and so forth. And if they were purely instrumental music, they had to have some kind of uh, essay explaining why this piece is Jewishly related. So, of course, anything with even a whiff of Holocaust gimmickry or uh, exploitation, that got tossed in the wastebasket. I don't even look at those kinds of scores. Um, and sad, but I'm sure, not surprising to most of you, um, more than 50% fell into that category including even a request early on in the game for support for the now infamous obscenity that I call the defiled requiem. If you know what I mean, good. If you don't, you can go look it up under defiant requiem. Whenever that subject comes up, I cannot refrain from observing that any Jew who buys into that kind of shameless, vulgar opportunism is inadvertently, and I stress inadvertently, buying in to one of the most vicious canards of Jew hatred in all history, which is that we as Jews are inherently, congenitally blessed by nature with the supreme talent for making a profit out of pretty much anything. Think about it. Anyway, among all the other essays, one really struck me. An applicant claimed that his piece was Jewish because it was about water, and so was a mikvah. This composer wasn't Jewish, and obviously he got that from some internet source. So now we know that Debussy's La Mer is Jewish music, right? <laughs> he didn't know that. Another piece was claimed to be Jewish because it quote, exudes the sounds of suffering, and I want to quote it correctly, and the Jewish people is known for its suffering, unquote. Okay. Nobody else ever suffered. Not the Armenians, not black slaves in America, nobody. It's Jewish music. The one I love best is the one that asserted that the piece is Jewish 
I'm quoting, because it is in G minor, and it's a known fact that G minor is the key of Jewish folk songs, unquote. Now that had to be a Wikipedia source, no way out about that. <laughs> but look, I love learning. I love learning, and so that I learned that something I didn't know, that this is Jewish music. <laughs> that was Jewish music, did you? Mozart really did write Jewish music. Now we're going to have an application for a grant to discover how Mozart knew Jewish folk songs in Vienna and whether it came from his Masonic Lodge or whatever. But that's the kind of stuff that goes on. Now look, my, my mentor, my advisor, and uh, later my senior colleague and friend, the distinguished American composer Hugo Weisskall, who was also chairman of the faculty at the Cantorial School of the Jewish Theological Seminary for more than four decades, used to caution about musical resemblances. He always used to say, keep in mind, there are only 12 notes after all. Of course, he was talking about the even-tempered tuning system, but we understood that. And in response to the question put to him many times for obvious reasons, what is Jewish music? Here was Hugo's answer. Well, for music to be Jewish music, it first has to be good music. <laughs> you, you had to know Hugo to, you had to know Hugo to catch the meaning. Right, keep it in mind because I'm going to return to that. Then, going back to at least the 1980s, there was Giora Feidman, the clarinetist, who, in many, many interviews, one after another, had this pet slogan that all music is klezmer music. When he was asked what it is, he says, all music is klezmer music. Okay, never mind that klezmer is not an adjective, first of all. And as a noun, it means only one thing correctly, which means, which is a member of the eponymous guild in Eastern Europe. All right. This brings us to assumptions about certain overall sounds. What sounds like something sounds that are called exclusively emblematic of Jewishness. Now, one can hear on a PBS DVD, probably most of you have, one of the most famous classical musicians in the world, also Jewish, being introduced to the music of what are, are called uh, klezmer bands today, incorrectly, and so forth. And at one point, he gasps in ecstasy this is the real Jewish music. Have anyone seen that? I'm not going to mention names. But you know what I wanted to say to him. I want to say, do you have any idea how utterly foreign this wonderful music would have sounded to the most traditional Orthodox German Jewry in Frankfurt or in Hanover or Hamburg or wherever? Do you have any idea how foreign it would sound or would have sounded to Yemenite Jews, to Persian Jews, and so forth and so on? Or aren't, aren't those others real Jews? So the problem of associating Jewish emotions with particular sounds or modes or styles is not exclusive to Jewish things. It can be dangerous uh, with human emotions vis-a-vis -vis music in general. I remember sitting in on one of Maria Callas' master classes at Juilliard when I was a young student. And a singer, a student singer, made an absolute mess out of an approach to a high note in a Verdi opera. I think it was a Trovatore. And the student, you know, defended it. And she said to him, Nicola, she said, no, no, that note is a cry of despair. It's supposed to be anguished sounding. You know what Nicola said to her? No, my dear, that note is not despair. That note is not anguish. That note is a B-flat. <laughs> so consider this. And by the way, at this tempo, at this tempo, It's 
sound particularly Jewish? No. Anyone recognize it? Well, that's because you're not a London-based Orthodox Jew. To any, any Orthodox Jew in London, now and for the past hundred years, that at that tempo would sound patently traditional and fundamentally Jewish because it is the ubiquitous quasi-official Adon Olam version for all Orthodox synagogues in the United Kingdom. Um, even though it was composed by a Sephardi Jew, De Sola. And it was composed expressly for the Orthodox synagogue. Now think of the majesty of the words. Think of it. So what is, what is what reform, conservative, orthodox all blended together today in this kind of thing? What do they think of as Jewish sounding? What's one of the most, the three or four most currently popular Adon Olam versions in Orthodox, conservative, and Reform synagogues throughout America that is Jewish sounding. Because I should tell you, this Adon Olam from London Orthodoxy, uh, when I did it in a New York synagogue once with my chorus, a young rabbi tried to tell me, you can never do that again here, it sounds like a church. To which, of course, I said, Reuven, have you ever been to a church? Like, oh, no, God forbid, I've never walked into a church. <laughs> How do you know what church music sounds like? I mean, this, this is what, what we have to deal with. But I'll tell you, I, I didn't pay any attention to that because I said, you take care of the words, I'll take care of the music. And um, I did it the following, I won't tell you what synagogue, but it was here. I did it the following week and then the following week. And by the third time, several people came up to me and said, you know, now I really like that. Of course, you know why. Because by three weeks, it was already traditional. See, so they liked it very but what is today the most popular type of thing? Never mind, never mind the absurd repetition of words there. That is considered a Jewish sounding. Well, I got news for you. Go down after tonight to McSorley's pub and it'll be even more familiar because that's exactly what it is. It's an appropriated Irish pub tune. <laughs> so, clearly, Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart's famous dictum about something completely different, if you know what I'm talking about, wouldn't apply if we paraphrased it for our subject, would it? Because we don't necessarily know it when we hear it. We tend to hear what we want to hear. And we tend to believe what we want to believe. And the sonic properties of Jewishly related music are not necessarily definable. Keep in mind that it was none other than Albert Einstein who said, not everything that counts can be counted. He also said that not everything that can be counted counts. And maybe on a certain level, that was what Hugo Weisskopf was getting at. Some of you may have seen the PBS documentary Broadway Musicals, A Jewish Legacy. I suspect you, some of you have. It proclaims that Irving Berlin's God Bless America was patterned on the opening phrases of the Ashkenazi cantorial repetition of the Ovos in Shachras and Musaf of Shabbos. That Berlin, quote, must have, I love that then, must have, heard it in the synagogue and adopted it for God Bless America. Yeah. As if Berlin ever went to shul on Shabbos. And as if, even if he did, that the ovos would be on his mind. But here's what we're talking about. Here's what one hears, it is true, in any Ashkenazi synagogue on Shabbos. That's what the ovos. <clears throat> so-and-so in this film says, he, that's where the following comes from. From the ocean, to the mountain, to the prairies, when you go. Now, this is, 
his scholarship, by the way. <laughs> now, first of all, that is a major sequence, for heaven's sakes. Bach would have been out of business if that were Jewish. <laughs> and if I had $100 for every one of those in the history of Western musical repertoire, I could endow Leo Beck Institute and the Center for Jewish History as well as Yivo. <laughs> but the only trouble is listen to this. So you have three oceans. Right? What about this then? Somebody knows what's coming, I can hear this. that Chopin wrote Jewish music. <laughs> he didn't know that. Now, according to this line of academic reasoning, Chopin would have had to have gone to Shul on Shabbos somewhere, I don't know, Paris, although I don't know, or in Poland. And he must have said to himself when the office started, I think I'll write a waltz on the office. <laughs> but you know it like this, probably. You probably think this. That's, that's what you think is the original, right? That's not. He must have changed his mind after he wrote God Bless America and said, no, I'll undo it. If you think that I'm engaging in what's called reductio ad absurdum, you are perceptive because I am. Yes. Because these kinds of propositions are absurd from the beginning. They're fine for... I don't know, cute parlor games and things like that. I would have no objection, but the fact is that they've actually become the stuff of serious academic, musicological, and ethnological attention. So lest you think I'm overreacting, what about this? What does this call to mind instantly? Anybody? Maud, sir. You think so? Could you play the example for me, please? Number one. didn't know that Verdi was Jewish. You learn something all the time. He's, that's, there is a doctoral dissertation. <laughs> Believe it or not. No, I kid you not. It's out there. And I will quote from the extract. There is a doctoral dissertation that has been written for a major university, that's all I can tell you, which claims in the abstract, Verdi used fragments of Jewish prayer modes I had to have three whiskeys after that. In many of the melodies of his magnificent operas. Now, of course, we need a new dissertation to tell us that Verdi's operas are magnificent and all that. Uh, but this is the kind of thing that is, is going on now. Absolutely. You one up me, but you're absolutely right. Um, Ray sips a low guitar. The thing speaks for itself. This is where... I think we, re we need to um, revive a kind of forgotten but very profound phrase, which is, so what? So what? So two perfect fourths, so what? How does any of this shtick add to our understanding or appreciation of a piece of music, seriously? And why does all this bother me? Apart from the fact that everything bothers me. for the same reasons it bothered Stuchevsky. Because the perpetuation of ignorance should bother everybody. But even more specifically, it bothers me because the contagion of this kind of 
chauvinistic fantasy, and that's exactly what it is, only diverts attention from hundreds and hundreds of serious projects that cry out to be addressed. The Jewish music tag posed a serious challenge to Stuchevsky, especially when he wanted to maintain his stance against adversaries in the Jewish Music Society in Vienna. And you can read about that in, in my article. Um, but he had colleagues in that society for the promotion of Jewish music in Vienna who insisted that it was perfectly appropriate for a program devoted to Jewish music to include a work in one case, for example, by Viennese Jewish-born composer Karl Goldmark, a piece which had absolutely no Jewish connection, no connection to any aspect of Jewish culture or experience whatsoever, and none was claimed. Now, this is something that I now call reverse discriminatory geneticism. And I think it has no place in Jewish-related programming or anywhere. You can just imagine how many times I've been asked over the years why, for example, Rhapsody in Blue is not included in the Milken Archive of Jewish music or on any program devoted to music of Jewish relation or experience over which I have any control. In fact, in recent days, there's a certain irony, or shall we call it hypocrisy, on the part of those who would justify this kind of thing as so-called liberal inclusiveness within Jewish contexts, while at the same time riding the bandwagon of cultural appropriation bans on campuses, in literature, on the stage, in music, because Rhapsody in Blue owes its primary inspiration not to the Jewish people, not to Jewish culture, but to exhilarating echoes of American black music culture, jazz, blues, and so on. Think about it. Historically, however, there was an important sociological dimension to the urge to claim Jewishness in every accomplishment and in every icon, not only in music. For example, in the 1930s and 40s, Jewish boys playing in the streets with Italian boys and Polish boys and so forth, they needed a Hank Greenberg about whom to brag. That was very important. I mean, the Polish boys had a Stan Musial. The Italian boys had a Joe DiMaggio and before that, Babe Ruth. And we needed to show that we had one too. This was a time of serious insecurity for American Jewelry. We don't need this kind of thing anymore. We should be way past it. And if we feel a need to take and demonstrate pride, I'm not talking about emulation, but pride, although I don't, I don't see how that's ever helped or protected us anyway at the end of the day. But if so, we hardly have a shortage of specifically Jewish cultural or religious accomplishments to invoke. So the Irving Berlin frolic I showed you is only one part of a long running, but by now tiresome parade of supposed findings in Gershwin, in most of Broadway, and in Tin Pan Alley. But the entire premise in terms of music of that Broadway musicals DVD is unsupportable. Broadway musicals are not a Jewish legacy. Habima is a Jewish legacy. Second Avenue, whatever one might think of it, is a Jewish legacy. Wissenschaft des Judentums is a Jewish legacy. Chassidut is a Jewish legacy. Chazanut is a Jewish legacy. And so forth. Yivo is a Jewish legacy, by the way. Broadway musicals are, in part, a collective legacy of many songwriters and lyricists who happened to be Jewish. From artistic and entertainment standpoints, claiming their work as ours is the very thing I just mentioned, a counterproductive, irrelevant form of geneticism. Now, on the other hand, that whole story is indeed a very important sociological and socioeconomic phenomenon. And in that sense, it's worthy of serious study and scholarship, but it's not a musical one. 
I mean, just how does knowing the fact of a songwriter's Jewish birth, or even, although it was unlikely, his Jewish life, in any way add to our analytic understanding or our simple appreciation of, say, oh, what a beautiful morning from Oklahoma, or June is busting out from Carousel, or any song from My Fair Lady, or Annie Get Your Gun, or whatever. And moreover, I would like to know which specific notes of Oh, What a Beautiful Morning would have been different notes had the composer not been Jewish. I come back to So What? And the famous lyrics of one of those shows say it even better. Let's go on with the show. Because what matters is the product, the artistic product. What about the classical music realm? Well, leaving aside Victor Borger routines and things like that, I have traced this kind of shtick um, in the classical world, classical musicology, and I've traced it back to about the 1960s and 70s, beginning, I would say, with the Mendelssohn obsession. But the seed for that seems to have been sown just a bit earlier in the mid-1950s, and I suspect that that had at least something to do with the climate of still unarticulated um, post-Holocaust sensibilities. Because before then, none of this type of shtick would have been tolerated within academic circles. None of it. Except maybe as comedic entertainment after a day of papers at a conference or something like that, but not in a serious way. So beginning in 1956, it was posited in a highly prestigious musicology journal that because downward minor triads can be found throughout much of Mendelssohn's music, this is unquestionable proof that, and I quote, Mendelssohn must have had nostalgic childhood memories of going to the synagogue with his parents because a downward minor triad is ipso facto of Jewish origin, unquote. Now, I know every one of you knows how ignorant that statement is. Um, but and I, I wouldn't even mention the article were it not for the fact that succeeding generations of reputable scholars have picked up on that cue in numerous ways and given that fantasy respectability. Now, that musical detective in the 1950s proceeded to state that, quote, therefore, Mendelssohn could only have heard and could only have been attracted to the downward minor triad in the emblematic concluding cadences of all the brachot in Musaf of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Although the author, even though he was a Jew, got that wrong too because he confused uh, the High Holy Days with Pesach. And never mind that the centuries old tradition of canonized Nusach for that portion uh, in the Ashkenazi rite was already inapplicable in German reform format anyway. But let's hear the synagogal reference to which he was referring. That's Track two. This is supposed to be evidence of Mendelssohn's repressed Jewishness in his attraction to minor triads, and was taken seriously. So I suppose Mendelssohn and that musical detective in the 50s and all his musicological followers have never heard of this. The minor triad, downward, right? Am I right? Morgana of Beethoven wrote Jewish music, did you? You didn't know that. Now, by the way, there's a great dissertation topic coming up. The only problem is Mendelssohn wrote that, uh, Beethoven wrote that in 1805. And there was no synagogue of any kind or character in Vienna until 1826. But remember, facts don't matter. It's only feelings. 
So apparently, according to this line of musicology, there is a great deal of Jewish music of which even those of us with the fullest command of the repertoire might not be aware. For example, Mozart wrote Jewish music. What about Schubert? Oh, come on. Schubert wrote Jewish music too. We're learning great stuff. And now if you really want to be Jewish and be in G minor, I don't know if I have a footstep for this, by the way, but let's see. All right. You didn't know that Rachmaninoff was Jewish, I'm sure of that. And of course, it, he could only have heard the minor triad in the synagogue in, Saint, uh, or in Moscow, where he was till he was 15, or maybe when he came to New York or something like that. Now, but you might say, where is the Jewishness in this? Okay, I might have played one or two wrong notes, but um, Stockhausen could only have gotten that he could only have gotten that from the chaos of a typical synagogue board meeting. <laughs> where he must have been a guest. Must have. Until, of course, he lost it altogether, but that's an old story. So where is all this led? Maybe Georg Feidman was onto something more encompassing than he realized. Maybe all music is Jewish music and let it go at that. And since all music in the Western tuning system is limited to 12 notes, how many tribes were ancient Israel originally? 12. Well, that's the connection. And all music is Jewish music. But then, recalling Weisskull's condition, that wouldn't mean that it's all good music, would it? Professor Frankus always used to say in his classes at JTS, I'll tell you when I'm being serious, which is now. What makes the culturally nationalistic music of Dvorak, Smetna, Janacek, the mighty Russian Five, and so on, good music, is the same set of criteria that apply to the pieces on tonight's program. It's not merely the quotation of folk materials, secular or sacred. For that, we don't need these composers. We can look these tunes up in anthologies where they are in their original, authentic guises. What makes it good music and good culturally nationalistic music is how a composer utilizes the folk materials, how these are manipulated and developed artistically to become worthy of cultivated concert music. So in the case tonight of Leo Zeitlin's Elitzion, which Julian Schwartz and Rika Bernacke would play for you very sensitively. I heard them rehearsing it. Stuchevsky, by the way, himself played the same piece on a Jewish music program in Vienna in 1931. Now, those of us who go to any Ashkenazi synagogue on Tisha B'Av hear that melody every year, Elitzion, as well as during the preceding Drei Wochen. But it is Zeitlin's delicate artistic treatment of the medieval synagogue melody that brings it into the realm of classical art music. And in that way, it transcends its original function, which was purely liturgical. So this is what makes tonight's music not only 
artistic reflection of Jewish experience, but of a level worthy of the superb performances you are now about to hear. Thank you very much.
being here tonight. It's, a, it's an honor for us to play for this spectacular institution and in front of some of our dearest friends. Neil Levin has been a, a huge influence in my life since I was a child uh, in many, many ways, foremost as a friend and then as a teacher um, as well. So I, I thank him for including us in this and um, special thanks to Alex Weiser who did incredible work in, in gathering all the music and for his inspiration and suggesting pieces and to Neil, of course, for opening my, opening my world to all of these great uh, composers that, that I did not know before. So it's been a great journey presenting and uh, rehearsing this, this, um, this concert. And I am fortunate to have two of my dearest colleagues and closest friends, Avi Nagin and Alec Manassi, to enhance the program. Um, even though it's predominantly a cello piano recital, as Stuchewski was a cellist, and that was the, the, the idea, there's just wonderful chamber music written as well. So I'm so happy they're here. Avi, one of my closest friends and uh, a wonderful violinist, and Alec, um, my cousin. So uh, keeping it in the family, not because he's my cousin, but because he's one of the greatest, if not the greatest clarinetist I've played with. And, and he's really, he's really um, uh, sensational and, and very young. So uh, anyway, let's keep, we continue. Thank you. 
work. I wanted to thank you all for joining us on this journey and this uh, quite lengthy journey, if I do say, but uh, it's, uh, it really deserved it, all this great music, but there's so much more um, than, we can, than we can fit on a program like this. But there's someone I neglected to, to thank in my earlier uh, speech, which is Marika Bonafi in the midst of... <laughs> for this weekend at Bard's Music, she learned, what is it, 200 pages of this, of this music. She even bought a binder for it. <laughs> so uh, it's, it takes incredible commitment on all of us, on all of our parts, and uh, again, 